Good evening, everyone. I'm Eve Kahn. I'm a proud board member of the Victorian Society's New York chapter. It's my honor to serve on the board of an organization that gets speakers as distinguished as John Stuart Gordon. Um, welcome to anyone joining us from uh, not only the Victorian Society's New York chapter, but other branches, including Savannah. We welcome all comers. Um, and what a treat we have tonight in store. What an incredible speaker. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, you may have heard these reminders before. Keep yourself on mute during the talk. Put your questions into the chat as they come to you so we can ensure a lively dialogue um, afterwards. And um, my, um, my trusty co-board co member, uh, Jeremy, will be putting into the chat um, links to our upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow at Fish's Eddy store at 19th and Broadway, I am giving a talk on um, the 19th century journalist, Zoe Anderson Norris and her connections to Tin Pan Alley, the stretch of 28th Street between uh, 6th and Broadway where American popular music was composed and uh, promulgated and all kinds of um, ethnic strands interwove there from the 1890s to the 1910s. Um, May 9th at the Groyer Club, we have an in-person event about back number Bud. He was the guy that you went to for old newspapers from the 1890s to the 1920s. So that'll be in-person, super fascinating. And uh, we have our Emerging Scholars event on May 16th. Uh, we have great submissions this year, really wonderful talks, including on um, an electric gown. So um, uh, the main event. John Stuart Gordon, the Benjamin Atmore Hewitt Curator of American Decorative Arts at Yale University Art Gallery. He works on all aspects of American decorative arts and material culture, specializing in silver, modernist designs of the 20s and 30s, and postmodernism. He also supervises furniture study, the art gallery study collection of American furniture and wooden objects. That's his formal bio, um, which does not convey that he's one of the most brilliant curators, the brilliant scholars minds working in the deck arts field today. Not only a tireless researcher, but an unrivaled synthesizer of information. He's a magician because he adheres to the facts at the same time, the basic structure of who made what and why and why it matters while laying out these amazing underlying narratives that shed light on um, how the world turns. He makes objects sing and it's been my privilege to be his friend for many years. Um, his show at Yale, that's the basis for tonight's talk, Gold in America, Artistry, Memory, Power, runs through July 10th and run, don't walk to see it. Thank you, John, for gracing us with your presence this evening. I turn the Zoom stage over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eve. Um, please send me your Venmo handle and I will repay you for that lovely introduction. Um, and welcome to everybody. As Eve mentioned, the genesis of what I'm gonna talk about tonight is my current exhibition, Gold in America, Artistry, Memory, Power. And as Eve said, it's on view until early July. So make a trip to New Haven, part of your spring and early summer plans. This was a pandemic project. Um, it grew out of um, holes in our exhibition schedule that emerged two years ago. And I'd always wanted to study gold. Um, I think it's a remarkable um, material. And Yale is fortunate to have one of the strongest collections of early American gold. And I use that as a springboard um, to look at this subject over a couple hundred years. The strength of the exhibition is admittedly the 18th century. Um, and what we're going to talk about tonight is the 19th century. So I am pulling objects from Yale's collections, but also from other collections um, that you may know to tell um, a larger story about kind of what gold was in, let's say, the long Victorian period. I'm going to look from about the 1840s up until World War One. I'm starting in the 1840s because that's when America's relationship to gold changes. There had been some gold strikes um, starting in the 1790s and the 1820s in Virginia and North Carolina. But for the most part, um, there really was very little gold to be found in um, what were the British North American colonies and what was the early United States. That is until um, an incident at Sutter's Mill in 1848 in Northern California when gold was discovered. And this 
shifted the politics, the demographics, and the economy of the United States. And overnight, sleepy uh, mission towns like San Francisco became uh, burgeoning, booming port cities. And I'm showing you as an example, um, this wonderful lithograph from 1851, a very early view of what San Francisco was and what San Francisco would become all based on this material it's tumbling out of the ground. There, there are two types of mining. Um, this is gonna get kind of specific for a second. Um, there are two types of mining, load mining, which is where one digs into the earth to extract ore, uh, or um, placer mining or placer mining, where one is kind of collecting gold that has naturally emerged. This is, um, these, these are things like panning. Uh, when we think of prospectors or people in the gold rush, you're thinking about people doing um, placer mining. And that's where these objects come from. These are two rather extraordinary um, gold crystals. If you're looking at these on your uh, monitor at home, you're probably looking at them at maybe twice life size. They're big. And they've survived because they are so big and spectacular. They were probably thought of as little mini sculptures. And they have, a, they have an archeological history that goes back to the 1850s in Northern California. And this is the kind of type of material that lured people from across the United States, from Europe, from Latin America, and from China to descend upon California in quest of their own um, gold nuggets and their own fortunes. And as this population descended, suddenly you needed kind of a new economic system. And um, almost immediately, local companies started minting tokens. Um, the companies in the East Coast minted them and sent them out. You had this kind of secondary financial market. These are not coins. They are not, um, they are not specie. They, are, they do not have government um, acknowledgement. The one at the top is brass. I'm sorry, not everything we're gonna look at is gold tonight, but it has a wonderful image of someone actually kind of like with a, the world's largest gold nugget in his hand. I love the kind of the self-reflective quality of this object um, used for gambling and unofficial, um, unofficial kind of um, exchange. The dollar token below is probably about the size of your thumbnail. It's quite small. Um, you could use this to buy groceries, to, um, to settle bets. You could not use this kind of coinage to pay your taxes, um, pay duties, buy property, anything that was an official government transaction. Um, you still relied on um, official coinage. And I'm getting into the weeds here because it sets up um, what would happen because with all of this new money and new exchange, companies start descending upon California in the 1840s. Moffitt and Company was an assay house uh, based in New York. An assay house is a company that um, judges the standard of a precious metal, um, weighs it, assigns a value. Um, they're essentially a bank, but um, without like a savings and deposit kind of aspect to them. And I love this object because it is tied to a man named Samuel Ward. He's from Connecticut. He graduates from Wesleyan in the 1840s. And like all college graduates then and now, he goes to New York to make his living. Um, he arrives in the big city and takes a job at Moffitt and Company. And this is in the late 1840s. They immediately ship him out with a few other employees to San Francisco to establish the West Coast outfit of Moffat and Company. So here, this, here you have this young man suddenly transposed to the other coast of the nation, um, trying to set up an assay house um, in what is essentially the Wild West. And um, within a year, he sends home to his mother this gold spoon. It's engraved on the front and the back the front says, has his initials, and under it, it says, to his mother. And on the back says, made of native gold by Moffat and Company, San Francisco, California, 1849. 
This is a loaded object. Um, it is an object about belonging. It's an object about memory. It's an object about aspiration. I love the idea that um, it says to his mother on it. Here is this young man so far away from home, sending back this memento saying, mom, I'm here, I'm safe, I'm happy. And look, I have a job where I can afford a gold spoon. Um, so what an emblem of pride. And on the back is a very different kind of pride made of native gold. You know, the discovery of gold in America. You know, when the British took hold of its colonies in North America, they really kind of hoped that they would do what the Spanish did in, in South America, um, probably minus the mass killings, but they hoped they would find a lot of gold and other um, raw materials. They never found that. And suddenly with um, the discovery of gold in California, there's this huge source of wealth. This is Bishop Barclay's Westward the Course of Empire Takes Command suddenly becoming true. This is the manifest destiny idea that really drove so much 19th century politics. The country is moving across from coast to coast and with that move, it has discovered riches. And those riches are being sent back to the East Coast. In my research, I was able to discover the probate inventory for, for mother, um, Nancy Ward Skinner. She lived in Middletown, Connecticut. And as I was looking through um, the probate inventory that went room by room through her house, I kept on looking for the spoon and it wasn't in the kitchen. It wasn't in the dining room. It wasn't in any public room. I finally found it in her bedroom. And Mrs. Skinner was not a wealthy woman. And this spoon, was one of the highest valued objects in her inventory. And I think that value was, was definitely financial, but it was also emotional, um, and which is why she kept it so close to her. With all of this money and all of this kind of um, surreptitious coinage happening, the US government very quickly realized we need to be there and we need to probably um, get control over all of this money. Um, the U.S. hired a New York City-based clockmaker named Augustus Humbert, and they named him the first um, assayer or mint master for San Francisco. So he was the assayer of the United States Assay Office of Gold. That is a mouthful. And he um, very quickly pulls together a few models, some um, maquettes for different kinds of coins, and he makes the the journey out to San Francisco. He has very little backup. Um, he has very little capital. And suddenly he's landed in a city where he's supposed to set up the US Mint and he has very few resources. He turns to Moffitt and Company. Um, he hires uh, Moffitt's in engraver, the man who probably engraved the spoon for Samuel Ward, uh, um, George Kuhner, a German-born die sinker. And he has him work up some of the, the models that he has brought with him from New York. And he borrows the, um, the presses from Moffat and Company um, to then make the first real official American coinage coming out of San Francisco. And what you're looking at is this rather imposing uh, $50 piece. It is about this big, it is gigantic. This is not what you would take to the grocery store. Um, this is really about storing wealth. Um, $50 was a lot of money back then. And, um, and you really get kind of the sense of the ambition of this new mint. Uh, Augustus Humbert very modestly puts his name and title around the edge um, in case you, you know, so he can be remembered for posterity, but also prominently listed is the fact that this is gold from California. And the US government would eventually buy out Moffat and Company, and that would become the San Francisco Mint. The gold rush in California peaks and ebbs, and as it does, a second gold rush begins in Colorado. And uh, Clark and Gruber is also um, an assay house uh, like Moffat and Company, but they set up in Denver. 
and they start minting um, gold coins to satisfy a local market. And this um, early coin from Clark and Gruber's establishment was made in 1860. I love the fact that it has Pike's Peak um, very dramatically depicted um, on the front of it. They've made it kind of this large kind of caldera as opposed to the more placid mountain it is. But Pike's Peak was the emblem of the Colorado Gold Rush. And I think it's fascinating that we have in our culture our global culture, this idea of equating gold with mountains. Um, think about the Spanish in El Dorado um, in that search for gold. Um, in Chinese culture, California was called Gold Mountain. And many of the Chinese immigrants who were coming to California looking for, for, their, for their fortunes said they were taking a journey to Gold Mountain. And then here you have another Gold Mountain rising in Colorado. Um, as with Moffitt and Company, the United States government um, partners with Clark and Gruber, eventually buys them out, and they become the Denver Mint. Um, so for those of you out there who are um, interested in coinage or have just kind of glanced at a coin and seen either an S or a D stamped on it, that is S for San Francisco, D for Denver, and you're looking at the history of the West Coast mints um, coming out of the, the gold of the multiple gold rushes. In Yale's collection, we have an album um, depicting Park City, Utah. And I love this page from it because um, this is a group of miners who work for the Ontario mine. And I like it because it, it humanizes um, this process. We think of gold in the abstract. We think of it jingling in our pockets, decorating our, our, our bodies in our homes. But this is something that was ex extracted at great human cost by people. And um, these miners um, are sitting there dressed, probably about to go down the shaft. Um, for those of us today, this is a, a remarkably uh, familiar sight because they're all wearing their personal protection equipment, um, which looks amazingly familiar. Um, the Ontario mine, I will admit, um, specialized in silver, not gold. They did mint some gold, um, but they also um, were mining ore and um, they were mining lead and tin as well. So silver, lead, tin, and gold were really what were coming out of Park City, Utah. I had a fantasy of being able to go into the Park City um, census records and maybe come up with names of these people. I, I ran up against a wall doing that because um, it was far more populated than I thought, but I was struck by where these people were coming from because um, there were a lot of people of German extraction, Swiss extraction and Swedish extraction. You really got a sense of that uh, people were coming from abroad to uh, seek their fortune. What was missing in the record though, were a lot of references to the other populations that were here and were involved in the quest for gold, namely um, native populations, blacks and Chinese. And of course, by the time you get to the end of the 19th century, um, you have the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, you have other kind of legis racist legislation that um, accounts for the erasure of these people from the um, public record. But it is important to remember that this group is all here. And people were very aware of the cultural mixing. If we could actually step back to that print I started with and just um, zoom in on the foreground you see uh, depictions of people wearing Western clothing as well as Chinese clothing. And when I was talking to a colleague of mine about this image, we were remarking on just how stereotyped the, um, the Asian figures are with the broad hats, the, the single um, ponytails and braids. And then I realized the Western people are just as stereotyped. They all look like they're straight out of like, you know, a, a 1950s Western movie. So this is an image that um, freely stereotypes all people, but it does affirm the fact that there was from the very beginning of the Gold Rush, great kind of cultural blending, but also cultural friction. And I bring out this kind of remarkable object that many people may know. Um, there are different versions of it. Um, this is um, this is the the story getting back to um, getting back to the East Coast. This is 
um, Bret Hart's um, famous poem, The Heathen Chine, um, that uh, becomes wildly popular and so much so, he writes it in San Francisco, it gets published in San Francisco, republished nationally, to the extent that Carl Mueller, working in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, is translating this poem into a um, into a porcelain beer pitcher. The backside of this picture actually shows the German um, god of beer, but on the front side, it shows Bill Nye and Asin at the culminating point of this um, poem getting into a fight over a card game. Notably, the poem was written as a protest against anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, it was calling out the hypocrisy of, of Western viewpoints. Interesting, it got co-opted by uh, people who, who were anti-Chinese. So it, there's been this remarkable flip in the reading of this, this imagery. And I think it's important to remember the origins are actually rather um, critical of, um, of the Chinese Exclusion Act and the whole, um, the whole landscape of California in the gold rush era. You didn't have to find a nugget of gold to become wealthy in the gold rush. There was a great larger infrastructure that came with it, um, logging, steel production, and of course, railroads. I'm from San Francisco. I grew up knowing about the concept of the big four. Um, these are names that are part of my, my personal history. Hopkins, um, Huntington, Crocker, Stanford. Um, you're looking at the big five because you have two Crockers. Really, it's only Charlie Crocker who's in amongst the big four. We'll forget the other brother, but it's just a great image that has them all together. But it's a reminder that tremendous wealth came out of this period. And tremendous wealth didn't necessarily stay in California and Colorado. It seeped back east. And I think probably a great example of that um, is one of our big four members, Collis Huntington. Um, he brings his fortune back east and he builds a grand house in New York. First, he, um, he meets a lovely woman named Arabella Warsham. They wed, um, and then they decide to really enter kind of gilded society together. And they knock down a number of houses on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 57th Street and have George Post build a huge pile for them. I think pile is the only correct architectural term for this. And, um, and I'm showing you an interior view. Um, many people will know um, Arabella's taste um, because two of her rooms survive. One, of course, uh, the dressing room at the Metropolitan Museum and the parlor, which is down at the VMFA in Virginia. Um, most people don't realize that this parts of the second house do exist um, and they exist at Yale. Um, in the 1920s, when the house is being torn down, um, Arabella's son and Collis's adopted son, Archer Huntington, had the murals from the house removed and sent to New Haven. Um, so let's focus on probably the most gilded of the rooms, the dining room. And you can see over the mantelpiece, um, this depiction of a bent figure. Um, this survives. All of the dining room murals were done by the painter Elihu Vedder. And they are so self-referential to a nouveau riche Gilded Age um, couple. Um, you know, the, the the panel over the the fireplace is actually saying, you know, goddess of fortune, stay with us. Um, you know, don't leave us. This is a great precursor to Sky Masterson singing Luck Be a Lady. Um, and if you can see in the the upper kind of the architrave of the room above the molding, there are little coves or little arches. And those are little lunettes figure, um, with women in um, wreaths. And I'm showing you one of those um, that survived, um, of course, the goddess of wealth. Um, the other goddesses are frivolity, mirth. These aren't the serious goddesses like, you know, love or classical poetry. These are the fun goddesses that you want to have dinner with. Um, 
what is not pictured in this room or in this old um, installation image that amongst the gilded paintings and the gilded woodwork on this coffered and domed ceiling frames a huge gold ceiling panel um, by Ellen Better, Abundance of the Days of the Week. So imagine this gilded aged inter interior, literally gilded. Um, and Elihu Vedder at this time is working in Rome um, and he's sending these paintings back to New York to be installed in the house. And he's thinking about Florentine Renaissance um, gold panel paintings, but he's also thinking about um, Ravenna. He's thinking about Byzantine mosaic, really creating that opulence um, and that just incredibly immersive gold experience um, of of kind of, of the Byzantine world. Of course, the Huntingtons were not alone in creating these gilded palaces. And um, I think this is a kind of a great moment to actually think about kind of the idea of the Gilded Age. This is probably the one audience where I don't need to explain what that term actually means. Um, but thanks to HBO, we all know it these days. Of course, The Gilded Age is um, a reference to the short story written by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Um, we think of it as kind of, we often think of it as glamorous, but we know that it was not a compliment. Um, Twain and Warner are really kind of calling out the hypocrisy of the post-Civil War era. Um, and really thinking about gilding and um, gilding as in just a sh thin sheet of precious metal laid over a substrate of a more base material. So creating something that looks opulent and looks regal, um, yet is only surface deep. And they saw that as a great metaphor for the social iniquities um, of the post-Civil War period. They were all kind of being um, suppressed under an era of refinement. And I think the Gilded Age is such a great metaphor, yet it is also so wonderfully literal because this really was the Gilded Age. Everything that didn't walk away seems to have been covered in a layer of gold. And so you have this famous um, illustration of William H. Vanderbilt's, um, the interior of William H. Vanderbilt's house, famously decorated by the Herder brothers with one of the chairs that's now at the Carnegie um, with this incredibly ornate, a fanciful design um, covered in gold. Um, and really saying that those who are at the top of the society are, are living in these gilded palaces. This extends though down at the socioeconomic level. Um, those at the median level could um, go to Kimball and Cabus um, who are ex exploring gold in a completely different a way thinking about um, gold pen work, um, gilt ormolu mounts, uh, but where the glimmer and shimmer of gold becomes so important to their aesthetic, or even down to George Hunzinger, who is producing um, kind of serially produced, just on the border of mass produced furniture for a burgeoning middle class and creating models that are um, gessoed in gilt. Um, this is aspirational furniture and you know, remember that this is a time when the social pyramid of the United States has just become a social trapezoid. Um, the people at the top of society have grown in number. Um, the, the upper middle class has grown. The middle class has grown. And everybody is hankering for objects that project their status, their aspiration, and thanks to things like the late industrial revolution and the gold rush, um, there is a lot more money um, to do this with. And you see this not just in furniture, but everything gets a layer of gold. Um, here's my shout out to New Jersey, but I could have also um, done manufacturers in New York and in Brooklyn, um, elsewhere. Um, 
really high style ceramics of the period are all decorated with pate sur pat or paste decoration, layers of gilding. Uh, this kind of more is more aesthetic. Um, I know that the aesthetic references are all across the board. Um, we're bringing in the classical world, we're bringing in um, Asian motifs, we're bringing in the Middle East. I'm thinking about this more um, on a material basis um, with just the amount of gold that is decorating these objects. Uh, also in metalware, um, here's an example from the Meriden Britannia Company, an aspirational object if there ever was one, um, a white metal spun vase that is suddenly living well above its means um, by being gilded in silver, brass, copper, and gold. And, you know, thinking about the materiality of these objects, um, this is some really hot stuff. You know, the ability to electro deposit precious metals on a, on a substrate is really, it's about as old as the gold rush. This is an 1840s um, innovation. And when you're seeing an object like this, um, you're looking at really high style, high technology um, to be able to spot electroplate was kind of a hat trick for the Meriden Britannia company. Um, so you're looking at something that's sophisticated as well as being aspirational. And you can do this, you can encrust your ceramics with gold, you can encrust your metal with gold, you can encrust your furniture with gold because you have a marketplace that has more capital, but also you have more raw material. Um, with all of that gold coming out of the of California, just like the silver strikes um, are also in are also bolstering the silver market at this time, there's just more of this precious material to use in new and innovative ways and at price points where they can get into more and more people's parlors. Those who know me know I like glass, so glass is not free from this um, this this argument. Um, you have thing you have people like Lewis Comfort Tiffany, who is inspired by um, classical glass that's been buried and ex and extracted and has this kind of iridescent sheen, and he strives to recreate it um, chemically. And um, Tiffany's experiments with what he calls his Favreau glass then lead to an entire explosion of coffee cats um, with Frederick Carter for Stu Ben creating his aurine. Remember, AU is the chemical symbol for gold. So, aurine is this gold glass. Um, you have um, Duncan, you have Lutz, you have all these other companies suddenly coming out with gold hued glass. I kind of pull these back a bit from the idea of gilding because um, gold is really not a process in this. Um, to make these gold lusters, you're looking at things, you're essentially, um, you're flashing these objects with a mix of silver nitrate, uranium, manganese, arsenic, a whole range of really kind of unpleasant chemicals, but mixed in um, amounts that you are heating the glass um, you spray the surface with things like tin chloride or lead chloride, and then um, under controlled atmospheric conditions, you're heating and cooling to create these really vibrant gold surfaces. So while not gold um, gilded, they are gold adjacent. But don't worry, gold and glass do have a very close and literal connection. Because if you think about some of the most um, identified glass with the Victorian aesthetic is kind of the two-tone amberina glass um, that um, was pioneered by the New England Glass Works, but was copied by every single glass company out there. Um, and this is this wonderful glass that shades from a cranberry red to a kind of um, a syrup um, gold. And amberina glass, looks the way it does because gold is put into the, the glass batch. The molten glass has a trace amount of gold mixed with it um, that causes that, yel that yellowish color. And then it is either blown or pressed. And then 
the finished object is reheated. And when it is reheated or restruck, the gold um, reacts and it turns red. Um, so this, this two-tone glass that we so uh, associate with this period, but do not think of in terms of metal, only looks the way it does because of the ability and the access to increased gold out there to um, blend in um, at the glass house. So gold is everywhere, even when you are not expecting it. But of course, we like solid gold objects and we have to spend some time with them. Um, this, there are not many solid gold objects out there. Even for the robber barons, they were a stretch. And um, even and survival rates are even lower. Um, nothing tempts a thief like a piece of gold and um, nothing staves off the pawnbroker like a piece of gold. So um, gold objects quickly came into people's lives and often quickly left. So we are, um, what remains is a rare small group of kind of solid gold objects that talk to the real extravagance of the late 19th century. Um, this tea service that's at the Museum of the City of New York um, is, is what remains of a larger set. It originally had a coffee pot and a chocolate pot. So it was three different beverages in one, all in gold. And it was, um, it was presented to Samuel Sloan um, on his 80th birthday, which also coincided with his 30th anniversary as president of the Delaware, Lackawanna and Western Railroad Company. So again, another railroad fortune and um, the type of wealth that um, these railroad magnets could accrue. Um, this, dark in it, dark. this dual um, it's a power, it's a power due figure. birthday and um, anniversary gift um, was presented to him by his employees, um, which also tells you about what kind of returns these companies were getting where your employees could afford a solid gold um, tea service for you. But of course, really, the other of all gold vessels is the Adams vase. Um, I will say if Yale has probably the strongest collection of 18th century American gold, the Met wins in the 19th century with truly extraordinary objects and um, probably a dream to bring both collections together because um, it would be a jaw-dropping show. And this may be the crown jewel of all of them. Um, the Adams vase, I think, is really this, the most summative piece of gold made at the end of the 19th century. It was um, commissioned to honor Edward Dean Adams, who was chairman of the board of the Amer American Cotton Oil Company. And although this is a tour de force of raising, of chasing, of sculptural work, of casting, of enameling. Um, it really begins to make sense when you think of it in terms of cotton. Bear with me on that. Um, because the whole conceit is the composition and the coloration is emulating the bell-shaped cotton flower. And at the very top, the rock crystal cover is a cotton bowl. And they've even choose, chosen to do that in rock crystal. So something that reads more white as opposed to um, the, 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 the gold tone of the rest of it. So this is all about kind of the cotton as the source of the wealth. A real object thinking about um, the decades following the Civil War and um, where you know the, the labor that goes into um, extracting and working cotton oil. Um, but at the time, even Tiffany knew that this was an amazing thing. So much so that they produced a book about the design, creation, and execution of this vase. And so although they only made one, um, anyone who was interested could get a copy of the book and have their own version of the Adams vase at home on their library shelf. It was presented um, in the mid 1890s. Fascinatingly, it made it to the Met in 1904. Um, so it was really only in Adam's possession for about a decade. This began its life and has really always been intended to be a showpiece in the public setting.
and it's hard to top. But it gets to this important role that gold had in the uh, post-Civil War period. Um, after the Civil War and after Reconstruction, the idea of should the United States go to a gold standard becomes one of the driving political debates. This question of a gold standard versus a silver standard as our monetary basis had been present since the founding of the nation. But in the 18th century, the value of silver and the value of gold were so far apart that to actually have a debate about following one versus the other didn't make sense. With the gold rush, it actually decreased the value of gold to not to parity with silver, but to a point when you could actually have a viable conversation about switching from a silver standard to a gold standard. Um, there were virulent debates in Congress, if you can imagine that. There was a lot of name calling, there uh, were slander wars, all based on this idea of do we shift our economic, uh, our economic model. Finally, gold wins. And in March of 1900, President William McKinley signs um, the Gold Standard Act and America goes on to the gold standard. Kinley's, um, Kinley's short-lived presidency is, um, is followed by Theodore Roosevelt, who has plans for gold. He is a personally a collector of metals and old coins. And so now that the United States has gone on to the gold standard, he has a vision for commissioning gold coins that will rival the beauty of those made by ancient Rome or ancient Greece, or would rival the, the nuance of the metals made during the Renaissance. So in order to enact this rather grand vision, in 1905, he taps the foremost sculptor of the day, Augustus St. Gaudens, to create a series of coins that would have monetary value, but would be sculptures. St. Gaudens begins the project. He dies in 1907, and one of his students, Bela Lyon Pratt, is tapped to continue this, this mission. Together, what they create, I think, are some of the most beautiful coins of the 20th century. Um, they are thinking about them as sculptors, so they are sculpting from life when they can, um, or they're looking at real models. They're thinking about issues of veracity, of vitality, of movement, of energy. Uh, Augustus St. Gaudens is trying to experiment with creating um, a coin of incredible depth. So to really get a three-dimensional quality to it. And when he delivers um, his, his coin, and this uh, one is the, the double eagle is, based on his you know, famous Liberty, um, and a version of this is, of course, the, um, is the memorial at the base of Central Park in New York um, with Lady Liberty aside. Um, he, produ he produces dyes that really demand very high, high relief. It also requires that they need to be struck multiple times in order to really get the gold to fill the dyes. This is a challenge for the mint. Um, to strike a die twice and not have it chatter is very challenging. So much so that the um, Charles Barber, the head of the Mint, had to go in and rework the dies to kind of smooth out some of the highest ridges to actually make these viable to produce. Bela Lyon Pratt did not fare much better. He did the inverse of St. Gaudens. Um, his coin steps back, it recedes. So everything that you're looking at as darkness on these coins is actually shadow stepping away from the coin surface. Um, so I love that these two artists are playing with um, going forward and pulling back. And this was an incredibly controversial design. Um, senators complained that the crevices would catch germs and these would be unhygienic. Um, this is an incredible misappropriation of germ theory right at the beginning of germ theory. So kudos to them for knowing what germs are, but that's not how it works. And it, again, Barber had to go in and readjust the dyes to make these, um, to make these producible. Um, St. Gaudens really never lived to see this happen. 
unfortunately Pratt did, and he actually writes to his mother calling, um, complaining about this, and he calls him um, Barber the Barbarian for what he's done to his design. Um, I love art historical irony, and these coins, I think, are great examples because um, they fulfilled President Roosevelt's kind of imperialistic vision for the United States. And for someone who was a so-called progressive, he held remarkably unprogressive views when it came to social issues, when it came to uh, Native American treatment, when it came, you know. Um, so it's wonderful that thanks to people like Eve Kahn and others, we know more about these coins and we know that they're source material. So Gustav St. Gaudens, as I mentioned, is he's modeling from life. And when he wants to make an image of liberty, he turns to his favorite model, Hetty Anderson. Anderson was one of the leading artist models of the day. She was the favorite of St. Gaudens, of Lafarge, of others. She was also um, a black woman passing as white. And um, so this is, so here we have Hetty Anderson modeling liberty on this gold coin. Similarly, Barber, um, I mean, similarly, Pratt did not want to create a stereotyped image of a Native American. So he bases his model, um, his image, not on a life study, but on these photographs by Frank Albert Reinhardt um, depicting Chief Hollow Hornbear, who is a Br Brule Lakota chief. And um, and we know that he was looking at these photos because he had a collection of a collection of Reinhardt photographs um, survived in his studio after his death. And this is some also some recent scholarship um, that is so we're finally able to identify the subject of both these coins. So here we have um, under Roosevelt's um, under Roosevelt's eye the first depiction of an African-American on an American coin and the first depiction of an identifiable Native American, um, not a stereotyped image on an American coin. It probably would have infuriated Roosevelt and many of his colleagues, but it delights us. I take the idea of the Gilded Age all the way to World War I. I realize as a political idea, um, it peters out in the 1890s, it's replaced by the Progressive Era, but in terms of culture and, um, and our, art, our the artistic world, I think this goes up into the 20th, 20th century, especially because those Gilded Age fortunes start becoming inherited legacies. And this idea of inherited wealth really shapes the beginning uh, decades of the 20th century. An example is um, kind of the poster child for tonight, this coffee service um, that was made by Tiffany and Company. Um, and with this new kind of aristocracy of inherited families passing money down, you have these new companies, you have Herder Brothers, you have other companies like Tiffany and Gorham, these companies that are just really catering to the carriage trade. Um, and, and subsequent generations continuing to build on this brand of really focusing on luxury objects for American elites. And this coffee service was designed around 1910, 1911, but it was a present for Alice Bielan's wedding um, when she married Pierre Dupont in 1915. And this is, again, this, um, the Bielan family was associated with the DuPonts. Uh, Alice, Alice's father was the head of one of the DuPont subsidiaries. And of course, Pierre DuPont is the heir of his family's gunpowder business um, that really made their fortune during the Civil War. But he is one of the people that kind of transforms it into a 20th century chemical powerhouse. And this, um, this gold, solid gold coffee service as a wedding present speaks to the, to speaks to the um, social level of this, this couple. I always ask visitors to the exhibition to imagine the dinner party where this coffee service comes out at the end and then extract out to what the rest of the room looked like, what uh, people are wearing. You know, this is part of a world that most people did not have access to. Um, the Bielan-Dupont um, marriage was admittedly one of convenience. 
Um, they were first cousins. They actually had to get married in an adjacent state um, that allowed first cousins to get married because there was great pressure on Pierre uh, to finally marry. Um, but this idea of celebrating weddings and wedding celebrations with gold is something that goes beyond um, just this one off. And you see it over and over again. I'm kind of pushing the boundaries of my time with this amazing coffee service at the Museum of the City of New York, but it's so amazing that I hope you forgive me. This is Black Star and Frost Gorham's coffee service for 20 with, salt, with gold spoons, gold cups, gold, everything. Um, and this was a 50th wedding anniversary present for Irene and John Hans. Of course, gold is the 50th anniversary present. So a golden wedding anniversary is a golden gift. And um, I love the fact that the depths of the depression, their children um, commission this extensive set for them. Uh, another 50th anniversary golden wedding pre golden present is this covered coddle cup on a salver made by Crichton Brothers. British, I know, but they did have an American store and the store, this was bought in the American store. Um, this was a gift from J. Pierpont Morgan to Joseph Hodge Choate and Caroline Sterling Choate um, as, a, as a 50th wedding anniversary present. And if you think about the DuPont set, the Hans set, and the Choate set, there's a remarkable conservativeness to them. They're all colonial revival in a different mode. Um, the DuPont and Hans sets are really looking at early 19th century neoclassical forms with these kind of helmet shaped um, cream pitchers and, and coffee pots. Whereas the Crichton Brothers is looking very closely back at late 17th, early 18th century caudal cups. Um, and I think there is a remarkable conservativeness to objects made of gold. One, they're expensive and you don't want them to go out of fashion. So you choose maybe a slightly retardaire style, but you know it's a style that will last. And at the, you know, the turn of the 20th century, the colonial was here to last. So this makes sense. Also, gold is pretty darn spectacular. So you might not need to gild your lily, lily when your lily is already made of gold. So the materials itself could um, speak for themselves. And then of course, there is that symbolic association of gold with the 50th anniversary. Remember gold is a material that does not tarnish. It does not lose color. It is eternal like love. And like many people hoped their marriages would be. Another 50th anniversary gift is, of course, this TIG made by Gorham and Company. And it was a 50th anniversary gift um, from James Stillman to John Sterling. And it is not um, colonial revival, it's more Art Nouveau in its aesthetic. It has these kind of, yeah, again, very conservative version, these kind of languid lip, whiplash curve handles. But on each side of this three-handled cup, which is um, the TIG form, it has Sterling and Stillman's initials intertwined and um, the 50th anniversary years um, from 1868 to 19, 1918. This is an, um, commemorating 50th anniversary of friendship. So James Stillman, what, these, both, these men were both um, at the top of kind of New York's financial hierarchy. Um, James Stillman was also involved in railroads um, and in other industrial pursuits. And John Sterling was a prominent lawyer. Chris Sherman and Sterling, the law firm that still works around today is his name. Um, and just in case um, any eyebrows have been raised about my talking about a 50th anniversary present between two men, I am not, I'm not saying that these two men uh, were celebrating their 50th anniversary because we know full well that John Sterling's partner was James Bloss. They actually lived together for 40 years and um, they were quite open about their relationship. Everyone knew that they lived together. And even in Sterling's will, um, it stipulates that James Bloss should have a place next to him in his mausoleum. 
So it's a nice reminder that um, even in the 19th century, some of the relationships that we might raise an eye at brow at now, maybe not everyone did. And, but it is a fascinating connection because um, Jane Stillman was of course, part of their intimate circle. It does not discount the fact that um, Stir Stillman and Sterling's relationship may have started romantically before it became friendship. And we may be looking at um, an incredibly opulent vestige of um, a very elite gay demimonde, which I think is probably true. I want to be upfront about these stories because, you know, they are part of the objects. Taking us back to Alice Beelan's coffee set, I was taking a group through the exhibition the other day, and I casually mentioned, or maybe not casually, I carefully referred to their marriage as one of convenience. And someone on the tour piped up and introduced themselves as a relative by marriage of Alice Beelan and said, you're missing part of the story. Pierre Dupont was gay. And everyone in the family knows that. And he reminded me that, um, or well, I kind of knew, but I loved hearing the family members say it, Pierre Dupont's real love was Luz Andrew Mason, the handyman and driver at um, Alice and Pierre's estate, Longwood. Um, and if anyone hasn't been to Longwood Gardens, it's well worth the visit. I loved how upfront the family was about this. And actually, if you visit Longwood Gardens um, today, they are very upfront. Um, and they even display some of the romantic letters between um, Pierre and Luz. And it also, again, is written in the landscape of, um, of the 19th and early 20th century. After Mason died of the flu in one of the early flu epidemics, Pierre Dupont built a hospital wing at Chester County Hospital and named it in his honor. So all of this history is right in front of us. And um, you know these histories can be heartbreaking and they can be heartwarming. And I think it's important to be upfront about all of them because every object has an incredible story that um, is just waiting for us to unpack. It can make us cry, it can make us laugh, but the stories are always there. I've only shared with you some of them, um, the ones that relate to the Gilded Age, but there are so many more. So I invite you to, not right now, it's too late, we're closed, but soon um, come up to New Haven and um, explore the stories that enrich the, um, the narrative of gold in America, artistry, memory, and power. Thank you. I am, oh, I'm gonna say this out loud. Yes, am, I'm, I'm going to take questions. I'll look at the... Uh, well, do, you, oh, do you wanna answer that first question about the connection between gilded architecture? When do we start gilding domes and, and lettering and this, and is that as early as the gold rush or is that predate the gold rush? Oh, that's a la antica. We go back to uh, the Domus Aurea um, and, in, and we go back to Nero with the idea of gilding architecture. So I think a lot of that uh, in the Western canon, I should be very specific, that's the Western canon, looking at um, antiquity um, for sources of how to display gold. Of course, um, Gilded architecture is also part of Christian tradition. Um, you know, the idea of creating a city on a hill or recreating um, the kingdom of heaven within the church. So gilded, especially Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. in the Catholic, Catholic tradition, um, you have a lot of gold and there's actually stipulation that you should use gold um, for anything associated with the liturgy, the communion service, um, you know, the, the, the host plate and of course the architecture, but that is also, you see that in Islam as well um, through inc the incredible amount of gilding you see in early mosques. So in every, there's something about this material that allies it with um, spirituality and power. Um, so no matter where you are, um, the most spiritually or politically potent 
site will often have gold associated with it. What, so how this, this show could have filled gallery after gallery, right? How did you, how did you limit yourself? I would have gone, I would have taken over a whole floor at the gallery. Um, I was limited, I was charged with doing an in-house exhibition. So really mining, oh, sorry, mining, um, using Yale's, Yale's permanent collection. Um, there are a few loans in the show, but really it is from Yale's collections. So that limited it because um, gold could be, it's a global story. It goes back to antiquity. It touches almost every continent. And, but um, really looking at the strengths of the um, Yale's collection was a very useful way to uh, rein in what is a very large story. And it could have kept going and going. Um, and I was also, limited, I limited myself by choosing objects that had stories. Um, a disproportionate amount of gold has a history. In the decorative arts, we all know that objects are anonymous. You're lucky if you have a maker of, you know, associated with an object, much less an owner and a, and a history of descent. Um, and yet with gold, I found over and over again, we knew who made it, we knew when it was made, we knew who owned it, we knew who inherited it. And the unusualness of that um, really inspired me. So then I did a, so once I kind of honed in on our, the American material, then I honed in again on things that had histories. But um, in a perfect world, um, it would have been fun to partner with another institution um, that has strong holdings. Um, I would have loved to have brought objects up from the Met. I would have loved to have brought objects from um, the Wells Fargo collection out in California. I mean, just things that are um, just scattered around the nation because it's a really huge, huge story. Um, someone has asked actually about another huge, huge story, which is Arabella Huntington. Um, we don't have another hour, but... Um, Luckily, she is eminently Googleable, and that will make for some incredible re reading. And there have actually been a few recent books uh, written about Arabella and her remarkable story, her um, rags to riches, and even more riches and even more riches story as she um, makes one advantageous marriage and then uh, marries Collis Huntington. Um, Scandalously, she is already already has a child, but um, Collis um, adopts Archer as his own son, and then after um, Archer, after Collis dies, then Arabella goes on to marry another one of the son, not her son. It's, it's there's interfamily marriages across generations. Um, so if to pretty much, if someone has the last name Huntington, Arabella either married them or was their mother. And um, it is a fascinating story about a really incredible woman um, with tremendous ambition and um, luckily the resources to see out some really incredible projects. Are, are you going to do a book now or is it, would you do sort of the follow-up catalog or is that is that not done? I thought I was being so... Um, cutting edge by only doing an exhibition that was an exhibition. And um, I have really loved the research and I've found some great stories. And um, through some of my research, through other people's research, um, to be able to add names to objects, um, identities to sitters. Um, there's just so much material that has come out in the last decade um, that I have realized I probably now need to write a book on American gold. Um, luckily, um, the book would not have to be the exhibition. Um, it could look at collections across time. Um, it could it could look at other objects, um, and I will learn things. I have learned things from having the exhibition op open. Um, people contact me with, like, "Oh, I have a piece of gold. Do you want to see it?" <laughs> yes, that's yes is always the answer. Um, and you know, there's. Um, so we always, every curator says, I wish I wrote my catalog after the exhibition. And um, so I'm in the, the lucky position where I, I didn't even 
consider writing the catalog until after the exhibition. <laughs> so. I'm putting to answer more about uh, Hetty Anderson. I am terrifyingly the world's expert on, on Hetty Anderson and her story. So Eve M. Khan at Gmail, anything, anything you need to know. Um, Paulding Farnham was fascinating too. I wish we had another hour for him too, right? Yes. And his family, because I think he ended up going off to mine. I think he worked with precious metals and then he got so interested in them. I think he, he went off to British Columbia. I can't remember the story. Fascinating. Yeah, it's more gemological than it is mining. But yes, he had deep connections with um, the gem world and um, and uh, how he, that's how he was able to get such spectacular stones, um, both cut and raw for the jewelry and the uh, exhibition objects that he made. Um, and you know, if you look at things like the Adams vase or when you're at the Met, then go to the next case and look at the Magnolia vase, all these things are just covered with the most beautiful stones. Um, that's really, that's Pauling Farnham and his, um, his lapidary interests and his acute knowledge uh, of just this material. So yeah, he is, he is just a, without peer um, for kind of the designers of the late 19th century. But of course, you know, Tiffany really cornered the market on great designers and great objects. Um, what have been some of the most surprising reactions to you to, as you've walked through the galleries eavesdropping? Um, the, just as I, this evening I was rather a friend about kind of, kind of some of the same sex stories in objects. I'm equally upfront about um, the history of slavery and um, where money came from in the show. And um, that has been very surprising because I was very nervous putting that material out there. Um, not knowing how people would react, especially at um, such a traditional institution as the Yale University Art Gallery and the enthusiasm with which people have embraced um, challenging narratives has actually been really comforting. And um, so that's been the surprise. I knew the shiny things would always make people happy because we, we, all, we all love shiny things, you know? But it was the, um, the more difficult objects that I, I thought I might lose people on. And um, it's turned out just to be the opposite. That, that seems to be what gets people, people going. I could not recommend John's show more highly. It's absolutely stunning. And the mixture of spectacular refinement and raw materials, and to know that America had minds that were enslaved people mined in North Carolina, the, the yeah, John, you just make magic. It's just magic. And I look forward to a book celebration. Can you see this? American glass. Next, it's going to be American gold, right? And it's I promised myself I would stop doing these thematic topics after glass and I would do something else. And then, of course, now I'm doing gold. So, yes, um, stay tuned for the next iteration of John Does a Material and um, <laughs> we'll see what we do next. Oh, thank you so much. This was absolutely riveting. Just a, a, a dash through. Yeah, John, you're just a magician. I, I could listen to you for another hour, but I'm going to let people go. This was absolutely, absolutely riveting. Thank you so, so much well, for, mining, for having me. For um, mining so much for us. Absolute magic. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. It was absolutely fascinating. <laughs>